All right, are we going to do this actual show? Or are we yeah, just gonna... we should probably uh, start I, now. I, I honestly just kind of want to talk about the water balloon war in an episode. So do I. But... All right. All right, <laughs> All right everybody. Welcome about a real war. to this episode of Dead. <laughs> let's talk about a real war. All right. Look at real start. wars. All right, everybody. Welcome to this episode. Well, we're not Dead including that, that intro? I thought it was well, great. Include it. I don't care. That's fine. You're the editor. I am. So, well... I'm Jake, in case anyone forgot. Eric and Cameron are here tonight. We're finishing up episode four, our bonus episode on uh, the Russo-Japanese War, uh, because basically we went, we just had too much to talk about last time, and so we decided to split it into two separate episodes. So we're going to finish off the war, starting with uh, the formation of the 2nd Pacific Squadron, Battle of Tsushima, kind of the wrap-up of the war, and the peace treaties uh, that America's involved in. But before we get hey. into that... Did we yes. go three for three tonight or? No. Oh. No, I'm, oh. I'm wearing my Pompeii the Floor is Lava shirt. So. All right. That's not mm-hmm. a bad. Yeah. yeah. Good choice. Shirt to wear. Thank you. But no, I did not have mine. I will be wearing it. I'll wear it next week then. Sorry, guys. I let you down. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> how was your guys' week? Weekend? Day? What were you guys up to this week? Been Any stories busy. from the dad front? Yeah, I've got one. I it remind me of lasagna because that's a great one. Um, okay. But we've been busy preparing because we're we're going to be moving soon mm-hmm. uh, from our palatial mansion of a rental house into an apartment uh, while we get a house built. So that's the plan, unless things go wildly awkward and off the rails. So we're trying to reduce things. My wife listed a bunch of stuff on Facebook marketplace yesterday, sold it. Uh, and so I had, I got home from a bunch of errands and had to disassemble several things from our backyard, a swing, the swing we built Jake. Um, we built a swing. Don't you remember that back at the condo? Oh yeah. Okay. Late. Yeah. Nice so, time. anyways, I had to disassemble that finally to sell it to somebody so he could fit it into it like his Honda Civic, um, like a little playhouse that we had from Costco. Mm-hmm. Had to kind of take that apart so we could get out of the backyard and get into someone's truck. It was just kind of this series of right things that that I had to do, and um, you know, we're just trying to downsize a bunch of stuff because we're going to put a bunch of stuff into storage. We're going to take a bunch of stuff with us to this apartment. It's going to be like living in a hotel for a few months. Should be fun. But also the opportunity to like reduce all of our junk. Go Marie right? Kondo. So much stuff. Um, and it'll just reduce it. And I think that's going to be great for us. Um, but just kind of this whirlwind of, of packing some things up we know we can take care of now. Trying to figure out where things are going to go. Um, so it's been busy this weekend. Um can yeah, I, ever I, since ever since you said this, Eric, I've my number. I, I've gone on record as saying, if you and your wife, if it ever doesn't work out, there's no love left in the world. But these next couple months, <laughs> after going, you know, from a palatial mansion to a two bedroom apartment, that's going to be a real test, right there. I'm uh, I'm praying for you, buddy. Yeah, I. You know, but see, the thing is, I, every time we've watched HGTV and they have the like uh, the tiny homes and I'm like, oh, that'd be awesome. 400 square feet. I'd love to live like that. Well, it's not quite as small as 400 square feet, but it's like this is kind of what I'm asking for. Right. Like it's going to be simple. And and the thing I don't like about this house we're in now and again, we got this because my sister moved out. We had a new kid. Um, we needed the space. It's kind of everyone spreads out and ends up in their own places and. Uh, we'll kind of force us together and we'll each have our own corners, but you know, it, there's something exciting about it. It's going to be a great, great era, great chapter. uh, What's the the situs of the house that you're building? The what? 
the size of the house that you're going to house. Build. Oh, it's uh, so what we're in right now is like 3000 square feet. Yeah. The apartment's going to be like 1200. <laughs> <laughs> and the house we're building is like 2200. So you're okay. going to downsize to 1200 and then you're going to move into a house move into your new big house and you're like, "Oh, you got to buy a bunch of stuff to fill all this space." Yeah. That's I know. what's going to happen. That, That's what that we did when we when we moved into this house, we didn't have an apartment in between, but we severely downsized because like, you know, we, we Marie condoed it, right? Like, what do we actually need? What do we use here? And we got rid of so much stuff. Do and you we love moved this? Into this new- I don't love this. Jake, that's your child. Joy. Yeah. <laughs> that's your child. Whoops. Well, he's kind of annoying me right now. So <laughs> he does not um, bring me joy at the moment. Not bringing me joy <laughs> at this moment. But then we bought this house. We moved in. We've been buying stuff to fill it back up again because that's capitalism, baby. So yeah. anyway, that's, we well, that's awesome, Soviets. man. That's exciting. I mean, it's going to be a rough couple months, but. So fine. as I said, we're going to move into this apartment and probably within a week of doing that, we're probably going to come to Arizona uh, to hang out for a few weeks. So that'd be nice. Yeah. Probably still be in awesome. Arizona, it'd be great. Yeah. I, I think there's going to be some great, uh, stories from the dad front um from eric in the next month or so just Eric's with gonna all go, the transitions he's gonna go suddenly gray in the next two months <laughs> yeah. it's just gonna be screaming during the, <laughs> yeah. the, the podcast i think i may have to go off site to actually record like to my classroom or something, but I don't, we'll see how that goes. I'm telling you, you got that pop-up camper. You can go from places (laughs) undisclosed. Perfect. Anyway, that's exciting, man. How about you, Cameron? So yeah, um, pretty good weekend. I was, um, did a lot of yard work. We're getting ready to um, spend a bunch of money on our backyard and our front yard. And you guys were heavily involved in the building of our backyard. So we've been ripping up all the concrete, isn't he? And um, speaking of a a real (laughs) friend, friendship tester, um, I had you two help me in the 112 degree Arizona heat pour a huge slab of concrete. Yeah, I found my way out of that. Yeah, with a kid, as if that was a legitimate excuse. So... But, well, but the lady yeah. at Home Depot said that baby wasn't going to come out until like the bre- next week. And yeah, well, she oh, wasn't the delivery nurse, so I don't about. trust yeah. her with much. But. Yeah, she was so confident, though, that, you know, I don't know why you didn't believe this woman you'd never met before. But anyway, so I, I was just kind of walking through the backyard. And as you guys know, I've been battling it for 10 years now, and I'm just just tired of it. So we're taking our stimulus money and and uh, paying somebody to once and for all uh, do up the backyard. So I'm excited. The wife's excited. The kids are excited. And uh, my daughter, my eight year old, convinced us she she's embarrassed that she wants the landscaper to be impressed with how hard we worked on our yard. So she said, come on, daddy, help me in the yard. And she, I mean, she spent a lot of time on Friday. I was working, but she talks me into going out there on Saturday. And you know, when you just kind of work yourself into a, into a lather and you just get carried away and you just start going to town on stuff. I was just uh-huh. working, working, working. I spent, you know, four or five hours out there. Oh, you're talking about anxiety for a moment. And I was like, yes, I understand exactly what you're saying, but you're talking about actual work, it seems. <laughs> actual work. I worked myself into a frenzy. And now I'm like kind of having second thoughts about do we really want to spend all this money on the new backyard? Because it looks pretty decent right now. I wouldn't say great, but it looks pretty decent right now. Um, so, you know, we spent a lot of time doing that yesterday. Um, and uh you know, exciting. We're, we're getting ready to, to do it all up. Um, but most of the day today, my, uh, brother-in-law and, and his family got a new puppy. So we went over to the house and met the puppy and, um, he's like a wizard on the grill, just everything he puts on the grill. He's got game meat. He's got, he went deep sea fishing not long ago and he just made me really jealous. So he's given me tips on the grill and I feel like I'm a decent griller, but I'm definitely not the best in town. So he's giving me a few tips. 
And real quick before the podcast, we started recording tonight. I grilled up a, a few um, ribeye steaks and they were excellent, excellent, excellent. So shout out to my brother-in-law, Donnie. He's a fan of the show. Um, Honey. He is, is definitely working with me on my grilling uh, skills. Donnie's so, a good guy to know. He is, man. He's that he kind is. of guy. He's the, our fathers, they all had a guy. Mm -hmm. Donnie's that guy. He's yeah. our generation's that guy. Like, yeah, yeah, man, I need to figure out how to get my grill to work. I got a guy for that. Yep. Right. I like, I need someone to help me with my taxes. Oh, I know a guy. That's Donnie. You know, the He's thing that with guy. steaks. Donnie's clutch, man. Yeah. The thing with steaks is, is getting it right is, is a fairly, it's simple. You know, bring the, the meat to room temperature, throw some salt on it. And then, and then eat. you know, however you're going to grill it, there's a variety of ways, but it's pretty simple. Like if you can do those two things and maybe add butter beforehand, yeah, you're 90% of the way there with steak. But what separates men from the boys when it comes to steak is those nuances. Cause you're right, Eric, I feel the same way. Like anybody can cook an eight out of 10 steak, but to get to that 10 out of 10 level, there's a big difference between eight out of 10 and 10 out of 10. Donnie has mastered that. And I'm, you know, kind of languishing in the middle somewhere. Um, but someday I will reach, you know, great dad bod status with a 10 out of 10 steak. I think, I, could, I think I've got a good nine, nine and a half. Yeah. Do okay. we need to have a steak off? Is that where, where are you okay. on that, Jake? You know, probably not very good because I don't eat a lot of steak to begin with. Um, mm. And... So, I, and when I do eat steak, it's at a restaurant because. Yeah, your wife can't do red meat. Yeah. Yeah. So it just, it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to buy steak and cook it up. Um, but it's funny that you guys say this about grilling because, so I was at Home Depot today and I went there to buy a hoe. <laughs> so <laughs> on my way to get your mind out of the gutter, Eric. It's not what you're thinking. Just, just a garden gardening tool. Just with a laugh. garden tool. Just, yeah. <laughs> I know. I yeah, but it was it. your grin, Cameron, that brought the <laughs> laugh on. I just saw it go ear to ear. When I, when I first heard what a <laughs> hoe was when I was a kid, I think I still had the same stupid laugh the first time I heard it when I was like eight years old. <laughs> a hoe and I'm like, <laughs> and I still think it's funny. And I don't, I don't care who you are. But that's not the story. The story is I went to Home Depot to buy that garden tool. But on the way in, all their grills and smokers are just sitting out there all shiny and new on sale. And I almost made a far more expensive purchase today. Um, mm. I mean, I, I withheld, but it was hard. They had these really nice gas grills and they had some Traeger smokers. And it was just like, yeah, spring don't it. Don't do it, Jake. Depot don't do it. A, it's a magical time for a dad. Yeah. Yeah. And they're all shiny and everything that lasts three months. And they're yeah. like, oh, it's so easy. And it's like, it looks so easy. But then I, it's so easy to just give us your money. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have the Home Depot card? Not yet, but I will. So that's my, my story of the dad front. We, we've been working on our yard as well, um, doing some work since we've moved into the house, just, you know, chopping down certain trees and plants that we don't want to keep. And then like, and then we just got a bunch of mulch and laid that out in the front. And do you have a forest like in your backyard? Because I feel like this is a, an ongoing story of clearing the yard. <laughs> so the way our house, when we bought it, we've got this chain link fence in the backyard and that thing was covered in these really thick, gnarly grapevines. And so we spent weeks chopping that stuff down and ripping it out of the fence and burning it. Um, and then on one side of the house, we had a bunch of trees that were like just there, like, and they were starting to grow into our roof. And so we chopped those downs on the side of the house. And then on the front, we chopped down a couple of bushes we didn't like. But yeah, there's a lot of vegetation on mm. our house. We've still got these three really nice trees in our backyard that we want to keep their fruit bearing. But um, it's just there's a bunch of other stuff that the previous owners let get out of control. And so we've been working on getting it back under control so nice. anyway yeah. me me and the home depot team have been fast friends over the past couple months real tight huh yeah 
Hey, All right. before we go on, I got one more. Uh, well, and story. Eric's got lasagna too, so don't forget that. Oh, that's right. I, I got story. one more just because I, I want to look back on this years from now. And I want to start this story by saying, I'm not an alcoholic, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let the record show I'm not an alcoholic. But, uh, you know, I, I do enjoy a beer from time to time. And uh, I was on my way out to a site walk uh, not long ago. And my four-year-old, she just takes a lot of pride in getting daddy a beer. You know, if I'm watching the game or whatever. Hey, daddy, can I get you a beer? Yeah, sure. And so as I'm on my way out the door, she says, oh, daddy, let me get you a beer for the road. So she runs into the garage, hands me a beer. And I said, hey baby, I'm, I'm going to go to jail if I drink this in the car. And, you know, so I had to spend, you know, a, a few minutes explaining this to her. And she was like legitimately sad that I couldn't take the beer, but you know, she was, she was being helpful, but again, I am not an alcoholic. How, how much better would it have been had you taken the beer? And then every time you had to leave, she's like, let me get you a beer. And you take the beers to the car anyways. You just bring them back to the garage later. She's but gonna- then like when she's 13, my dad, she could just say, yeah, my dad, Takes beer to the car all the time. Yeah, you know, that would have been that story. <laughs> I do I appreciate remember. that your daughter implicitly understands the rule of taking a roadie, you know, one for the road <laughs> to go. So I, I respect that. I think that that speaks of high character, frankly, because she's yeah, she's yeah, a, she's a she, she's, she's a considerate. Good yeah, I used to remember all those commercials: "Don't drink and d- drive, don't drink and drive." And one day, my dad, we went and got like drive through, and he got a soda, and I'm like, Dad. You're drinking and driving. I did the same thing with my dad. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Like it just made sense to me. My dad was a felon for having a Dr. Pepper. (laughs) Maybe this is my childhood speaking, but growing up in Wisconsin, drinking, not drinking (laughs) and driving was more of a suggestion. So that was, that wasn't a hard and fast rule. Like technically it was illegal, but like, eh, he's fine. So maybe he's on the right side of the road. Yeah. He's, he's fine. Yeah. Anyway, um, it's a lasagna story. Lasagna. Okay, so you know, I was so impressed with Cameron's previous stories of of you know disciplining children in a proper way. Oh, he wants to get into the book, Cameron. And I and I'm like, listen, I'm not great at all this kind of stuff. This is where I'm not shining. I might be loud, but I'm not shining. Um. (laughs) But my youngest, he's three and a half, and we made lasagna one night. My wife is just struggling. She's like, you got to eat this. You got to eat this. She's cutting it into smaller and smaller pieces. Like, is this piece small enough? No, it's too big, too big. Finally, she gets him to eat some, and he's like, "Uh," you know, he's not eating. I'm getting kind of irritated. I'm getting to that point where I'm like, I may slam my hands down on the table and be like, you're eating this, thus ensuring that he doesn't eat anything the rest of the night. You know, like, (laughs) I'm just going to ruin the whole situation for everyone. Nice. So my daughter, she's nine. She's like, well, let me work my magic. (laughs) And so she gets him to eat some of this lasagna. And he's got it in his mouth, but he's still crying. I decided to take a good step. I said, you're going to sit in timeout. I sat him down. And he's got lasagna in his mouth. He's crying. (laughs) I'm like, oh, just to your lasagna, kid. And I sit on this couch that's near our dining room table. And I'm just, I was done eating. I'm just kind of watching him and he gets up and, and he, he walks up to me and I'm like, you need to go sit and time out. That's where you're sitting right now. And I'm trying to keep my cool. Like I'm making the decision. I am not going to lose my cool. <clears throat> and I'm standing in front of him. My wife's at the dining room table off to my left. My other son is there off to the left. My daughter's gone over. She's sitting in a rolly chair over there. And he looks up at me and spits it into his hand. And I'm like, you little turd. And then he looks at me, <laughs> flings it no, he right didn't. over my shoulder. And, and I hear it hit the wall. And I'm like, I hear it hit the wall. And I knew it stuck. So I turn around and I look and there it is on the wall. Some of it's fallen off onto the couch. And I'm just like, and I cover my mouth because... I'm laughing. This is hilarious. Wow. I look over my wife. She, her eyes are wide, but she's also about to bust out laughing. 
my, my other son and my daughter are both giggling. And I'm like, you two need to stop. Cause I know this is hilarious, but you guys cannot laugh because you're just going to encourage him. And I turn around, I look at him and I say his name and I grab his hand and I walk him to the kitchen. And I'm like, the fact that there's some humor involved means I didn't lose my cool. Walk him to the kitchen, get a paper towel, like get it wet. And I'm like, you're going to go clean it up. And I walk him back. I'm like, you're cleaning it up. And he's like, oh, no. he's like his, he's like, my hand has stuff on it. I'm like, yeah. Cause you spit it out in your hand, like <laughs> clean it up. And I'm trying to like walk him through, clean it up. I'm like, I succeeded in not letting him. That's awesome. Just twist, you know, that knife in my side. He didn't get me. I maintain my goal, but it was just you're a better man. I mean, than that I. was a, no easily way I a, kept my cool. a 10 foot toss on his part and overhand respect the arms. Yeah. yeah. I, this is why we do this podcast. Stories like that are why we do this podcast because now when he's older and he yep. thinks he's all cool, you can literally <laughs> play back the video and yep. say, no, no, no. And that's awesome, man. Wait, I don't know how you kept your cool there. I would have I don't lost either. my mind. Because there's times much less where I put my hands down on the table and been like, children are to be seen and not heard kind of thing. Yep. Which I there's days where I'm like, we can go back to that anytime now because <laughs> just talk right past you. Uh, at this point, that, that cat's out of the bag. There, this new I, generation. If I, if I tr- no, I'm just saying if I tried that, they would just laugh at me. If I was my, my kids would be like, that's cute, dad. Go sit down and read your book. So um, anyway, that's a great story, man. You know that's where you awesome. sit, dad. So, Get over there. Yeah, I know my place and it's not at the top. Um, so speaking of my son, I don't know where he learns this stuff. Out of nowhere, he's just starting to say, what the heck is going on, man? Like, what are you watching? I don't think I watch anything where that gets said. I, I don't know if it's something learned or if it's like a genetic thing. It's an instinct that just kicks in. Or just, I'm going to just start saying things like I'm an old man. Anyway, what the heck is going yeah, on? Yeah, ours. He, right. He'll just say, "What the heck?" I'm like, yeah, I don't know where. Yeah. Anyway, who knows? Kids these know. days. What are we talking about? Russo Japanese War, Trans World, Trans World. This episode of Dad Bot History is brought to you by, take it away, Eric and Cameron. Trans World Business Advisors. So if you own your own business and you know the challenges of dealing with employees, customers, social media, Jake, Cameron, Jeff, for my um, part, I'm sorry, uh, government that? regulations and the rest of it, mm-hmm. uh, those darn govern- government regulations are the, the worst of it, I would say. Uh, with the pandemic coming to an end, hopefully, if our politicians allow it to happen, there are hundreds of buyers coming to the marketplace looking for existing businesses to buy. If you are ready to cash out and you need, if you are ready to cash out, you definitely need to call Trans World Business Advisors today. They have a database loaded with interested buyers and have over 40 years of experience in the industry. They're going to guide you through uh, setting a price for your business. They have a database with sales data from tens of thousands. That's four zeros of sold businesses, and they know the market <laughs> price for your listing. It's a math thing. Thanks I'm for to breaking that down, Doc. Decimal <laughs> spaces. <laughs> Hey, they matter. Brands World Business Advisors will find qualified buyers with their extensive reach and market-leading advertising. Trans World will ensure that the closing process goes as it should. And when you leave the closing table, you'll get paid and will be free of liability and responsibility. Nobody wants those things, right? So if you're a buyer, Trans World can help you as well. Uh, from evaluating business to helping with funding, they are there for you all the way your first day as the owner of your own business. Call today and set up a discreet and confidential consultation with a local representative. You can reach Jeff Peterson at 903-422-6818, or you can go to www.tworld.com. Again, that is www.tworld.com. Tworld.com. Anytime I hear the word discreet, I think something sneaky is about to happen. Yeah, 100%. And I'm well, okay with buying that. and selling businesses is a discreet 
secret. I get it, but I don't feel like that's what the word should mean. Like I understand buying and selling business is discreet, confidential. I understand that, but I feel like when I hear the word discreet, there's a guy in the corner wearing a trench coat selling you illegal no, watches. No, we've got to do some business. Yeah. of course hey. it is. <laughs> Hey, you want to buy a business? Hey, you want to sell your business? Like that's all you know. You might be interested in. Yeah. You want to buy a bowling alley? Hey, <laughs> want to go buy a charcuterie? I know one. I got a guy. Anyway, that's all. Charcuterie or charcuterie? I think it's char. Charcuterie. That's okay. I'm just you want a right. delicatessen? Delicatessen? Yeah. A deli. I'll take a deli. Yeah. Yeah, and and. Again, definitely, we need to uh, work on a, a jingle for Trans World. One way or another, it, it's it's snappy. It's it's going to move. Yeah, that's it. We're going to have to. Well, Eric, when you're in Arizona, you can workshop with Cameron. Yes. Yeah, we'll uh, yes. we'll get together, get in the studio. Yeah, just try some things out. Yeah, I mean, I'm a I'm a plus singer, so you know, <laughs> I'll lay a bass track together. We'll be great. Yeah. All right. Let's do this. Uh, Russo-Japanese War, part four, Battle of Tsushima. So where we left off last time, which is, I guess, two weeks ago now, is the Port Arthur had fallen. So Russia was under siege at Port Arthur for about eight months. It finally fell in on January 1st is when they they surrendered to the Japanese January 1st 1905 there were some large battles Mukden being the biggest battle at the time nothing was really going well for the Russians their Pacific fleet had been destroyed they were losing uh, on the land war and Port Arthur had fallen so that's kind of what leads us up to now however Russia is still very committed to winning this war they feel like all the setbacks they've had are, are just that they're setbacks. None of them are crushing defeats because they're going to send an entire second fleet to wage war against Japan. And they're constantly uh, reinforcing their soldiers from, from Moscow, St. Petersburg to uh, via the Trans-Siberian Railway. And so the war, while it looks like everything has been in Japan's favor, Russia is by no means out of the situation. And Russia really hasn't brought its full weight to bear. Mm -hmm. And and I think, you know, we're talking about that reinforcement from St. Petersburg. It's not like the Japanese are going to get on one of those trains and go take Moscow, right? That's not the concern. Yeah. Um, so the Russians can just hold land, even though they're going to lose those battles. They can hold that and just absorb the Japanese until they get a fleet out there. Yeah. And, and another thing to, to remember is Japan is fighting as an underdog here. They don't have unlimited soldiers. Russia, I think, I think the, the numbers I saw is Japan had about 30 or 40 million people at this time, citizens of, J of Japan. And I think there's about 100 million Russians. So Russia has four times the number of people that they can continue to just send into this battle, which is kind of how Russia wages wars. They just overwhelm you with numbers. Japan is also short on money. They don't have, even though they've made great strides since the 1860s, they don't have the kind of economy that can just wage an endless war. So time is not on Japan's side, even though all the big victories have pretty much gone to Japan, or even if Russia does have a victory, it's been very costly it's not on Japan's side to have this war drag out much longer because if it does, it, it, it will bankrupt them and they don't have enough soldiers. Like the army they have is the army they have. The Navy they have is the Navy they have. They can't just make a new army. They can't just build a new Navy. They, they, yeah, they gotta I, work I with think that's a really good point, Jake, that um, was lost on when, when I was doing my research and reading, I, I somehow didn't get the full understanding of that is you know, that's why from the beginning that Japan tried to blitz uh, Russia because, mm -hmm. hey, this is a ticking time bomb. This huge, gigantic Baltic fleet is coming to smash us. So we better get this job done before they get here, really. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's important because I asked the, the question probably in ignorance last time of, hey, what if the war would have stopped after 
Port Arthur Falls. And, and you guys both kind of corrected me on that and said, and eh, not likely to happen because of the war was really just getting started there in uh, in Russia's mind. Yep. But it, it's it's as if Japan Japan is seeking to strike one decisive blow. Yeah. If they yeah. can do that, they're going to just show Russia this is not going to go well. We're going to defeat you one final time at a location to get Russia to the peace table. Japan has secured what it wanted to uh, secure. That is Port Arthur, the Korean Peninsula, the Laodong Peninsula. They've secured that. Now they just need to win that one victory. Should have been Mukden. Uh, could have been uh, any of those battles, right? But yeah. the Russians, their mindset is we haven't yet begun to fight, right? Like mm -hmm. we haven't really brought our full army that we can bring. Our fleet had an unlucky spell by being, uh, you know, surprised at Port Arthur. Uh, we had an unlucky battle at Yellow Sea. You can have two unlucky battles. Once our main fleet gets there, yep. we will wipe out the, the Japanese fleet, their Japanese Navy. And we will actually surround the Japanese army that's in Korea and Manchuria. And uh, then we can basically starve them out. Japan yep. is not going to build a new Navy while we're there. Uh, if If the Russians can strike a victory with their fleet, they're quite large fleet that's on its way mm -hmm. that will end it in Russia's favor. Yep. Um, and so that's kind of that, that balancing act, right? Japan just wants to, like you said, be quick, strike, strike hard and fast and end it. And the Russians are like, wait till we actually bring our real fleet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That's a good point. I think let's get into that new fleet that's about to, to come. So after the death of Makarov, Tsar Nicholas II orders the second the Baltic Sea Fleet to become the Second Pacific Squadron on April 30th, and he uh, picks Rear Admiral Zinovy Petrovich Rosas Rose Rose, sorry Rose That's a mouthful. Yeah, Rose who is considered a completely a very competent organizer to be the admiral of this new fleet, the Second Pacific Squadron. This squadron, and this is on April 30th, 1904. So about two months after the war starts, and this is right after the death of Makarov, that, that admiral who was possibly, had he not died, could have been a, a turning point kind of guy for the Russians. But he dies. Nicholas realizes we've got to reinforce the fleet in, in Port Arthur. And so we need to get a second fleet out there. An interesting note, though, when this war broke out in February of 1904, there were already 11 Russian warships in route to Port Arthur from St. Petersburg to reinforce the fleet there. They had actually completed going around the Horn of Africa. And for whatever reason, and I didn't dig too deep into this, but for whatever reason, all 11 were recalled back to St. Petersburg instead of carrying on to Port Arthur. And I don't know why that was. I don't know if the Russians are like, Eh, the fleet we've got there has got it figured out. Or another possibility is once war breaks out, all the neutral ports become very difficult to refuel at. And so that might have been why they couldn't, they would have had a difficult time continuing the rest of the way there. But right, because those we're, 11, not, we're not talking about wind powered ships anymore. These are all coal powered or steam powered. Exactly. So they require coal. Mm -hmm. And, uh, if you're going to get coal, you can't get it from a neutral port, according to but these can, rules of war. But you can only be in a neutral port for 24 hours to refuel, and then you got to be gone, or they can inter you for the demerit for the remainder of the war. So you've got to, which is it just an odd concept? It it's is like a weird. You yeah. lose. You go to a, a neutral port, and you're like, "Well, we got to repair a ship." Well, it's going to be more than 24 <laughs> hours, so you're interred here. Yep. Who enforces that? Yeah, and I guess that's my the idea. harbor. I guess. I yeah. It's just kind of wild. It's like, yeah, so you're stuck here until the war's over. Yeah. It is I an odd. I'm, yeah. It's just an odd way. Right. Well, there's some odd rules of war we're going to bump into here during this journey, right? Yes, very much so. And so, but it is interesting because there's these 11 Russian warships. I don't know if they were battleships, cruisers. Yeah. I don't, I don't know that. But they were on their way to Port Arthur when the war broke out. And then they turned around and went back to St. Petersburg, which takes months <clears throat> to go back to St. Petersburg. 
I don't know why they turned them around, but had they continued on and had they been able to figure out the logistics of continuing on and, and refueling, they would have, I mean, how much trouble would that have been for the Japanese if 11 Russian warships show up mm-hmm. a couple months into the war? I mean, that's going to make it a lot more difficult for Togo to to be able to, to keep the Russians blockaded in Port Arthur and fend off this secondary fleet that's coming. Yeah. But that's a what if question. Doesn't happen. But on April 30th, the second Pacific is ordered. Rohestvensky is the admiral. He's the one that's in charge of putting it together and getting to Port Arthur. This squadron consists of seven battleships, including four brand new ones. The four brand new ones are the Suvorov, the Bordino, the Imperator Alexander III, which is just an awesome name, and the Oral. Um, Then there's three older battleships. It also has three armored cruisers, three protected cruisers, nine destroyers, and then nine other ships for repairs, tug, hospital, um, just kind of those miscellaneous fleet ships. But here's the problem. The fleet was ordered to be put together on April 30th. For various reasons, it did not leave um, the Baltic Sea until October 16, 1904. So it took, what was that, five, six months from, we need a new fleet to get out there from when it actually departed. So that's a huge delay. At this point, by the time it leaves St. Petersburg, or the Baltic Sea, the Battle of the Yellow Sea has already happened, and the fleet in Port Arthur is essentially neutralized. The Vladivostok squadron is also destroyed, and the siege on Port Arthur will end in about a month and a half. So because they took so long in departing from the Baltic Sea and getting to, well, just departing, the, I mean, had they left in August, had they left it, like if they just left a couple months earlier, it would have been so much better for the Russians as we'll find out later. Yeah, and I I think it's important. I I was reading this and, um, you know, this is an 18,000 nautical mile trip. You know, it's it's an unbelievable journey. Um, And this is such a big number, it doesn't even hardly mean anything to me, but we're talking about half a million tons of coal that it took to get that fleet there. So obviously there's, there's a certain amount of logistics to just get, get them going. And then, like you guys said, the, the 11 ships that started and, and, and went to the, to the war, the, the first fleet, I guess, this is the second fleet that's coming. Um, It's just a big math problem, just physically to get them there. um, No wonder it took so long, but it was, it was just a major problem. Yeah, um, something that I think I know I have overlooked in in a lot of my readings in history is the logistical problem of, of fighting a war is something that yeah. when people say never fight a land war in Asia, that that old joke, it's because logistically it becomes a nightmare. Yeah. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant became a great general because his training and early years were spent doing logistics. So he knew how to supply things. Here you've got it's going to co- it's going to take 500,000 tons of coal but you can't put that much coal on these ships right you can't get that much coal in a neutral harbor so you have to send out colliers or colliers ships that carrying coal to go refuel the fleet and route so you have to send ships from other places to go refuel them while they're at sea at like i forget how many 16 different spots to refuel on their way there, which takes time to refuel that. Um, I was reading about the Alexander the third, one of these new battleships could fit 1100 tons of coal in its bunkers, but they actually stored twice that amount, like in the living quarters, in the mess hall, between the guns on the deck, Mm -hmm. like they stored coal anywhere they could put it. And to imagine this is going to be an eight month journey where you're living amongst coal just so you have enough to make it to the next spot. The coal is in everything. The The sailors complain that they're breathing in coal, they're eating coal. Yeah. Uh, and, and I don't know how much you got into this, Jake, just 
the uh, morale of oh, Russian awful. sailors on the way to the battle or on the way to the Pacific was awful. You have the, the four new ships, the newer parts of the fleet go around Africa. The older ones, which are slower, go through the Suez Canal. Um, which, let's talk about there. that. Yeah. Why did they? Why did he have the newer ships go around the Horn of Africa and not the Suez Canal? Do you remember? Did you remember I, why? I, I it was because he was afraid they would get stuck. Oh yeah, because so the Suez big. Canal was. He thought they were going to get stuck. Which, how ironic! Just a yes. month ago, the Suez Canal was blocked and it destroyed the global economy for two weeks. Yeah. Like, yeah. and so yeah, he he sent the the older ones through the Suez Canal because they're a little bit smaller and they can't go as fast as the new ones. And yeah, but anyway, sorry, I just wanted to. Yeah, bring that's, that up. I forget. Yeah, because yeah. they were much larger. And so, yeah, you've got a couple of mutinies that happen along the way. They, they get word of, uh, was it what? They got word of a battle when they were in Madagascar. Yeah. They heard, they got word that part Port Arthur had fallen once they get to Madagascar. So morale is already low, yeah. but then you get the gut punch of, Oh yeah, our uh, our main port has fallen, so things are worse. And you have all of these uh, records of sailors who their morale is like, because before they even get anywhere, they're like, "Can we just go to?" There's the Dogger Bank incident, <clears throat> which is where the Russian fleet happens upon in the North Sea some British trawlers, right? Some yeah, fishing boats, fishing trawlers, yeah, and they end up like shooting at them. <laughs> well, they think that they're <clears throat> Japanese torpedo boats. Okay. That's what they, they, and I forgot which ship it was that, that was the shot that heard around the world sort of thing, but they're like, they're Japanese torpedo boats and, and they fire on them. They sink one of them. I think a couple people die, a couple fishermen die. And this isn't good because Russia, Britain already doesn't support Russia in this war. Remember they ostensibly right. support Japan. Right. And then Russia fires on a bunch of British fishing boats and Britain is like, okay, you want to play this game? <laughs> like they're ready to roll. And um, and like uh Tsar Nicholas has to like call his cousin King George the Fifth. George and be like, hey, no, 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 no. Let's <laughs> figure this out. Let's not, no, no, we're so sorry. We're so sorry. Cause Russia thinks they can beat Japan, but they absolutely know they cannot be uh cannot beat Britain. Right. Yeah, the, the British fleet is not going to be trifled with here. So this, this, and that was on October 21st. Remember, they didn't leave until October 16th. Yeah, this is like this five, five days, days in. Later. Their voyage is almost over before it really began and, because and of the Dollar so Bank incident. Some of the, like the sailors, the Russian sailors, there's letters that they've got where the Russian sailors like, uh, it might be more beneficial to fight the English right now. So we can just... That way we don't have to travel eight months to find the same fate. I mean, and die. Yeah. the morale among the Russian sailors was pretty low. There's at least well, two mutiny, mutinies near Madagascar. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> There's plenty of self-harm and suicides that happened along the way. Um, and, and there so was Sarge another was incident like, where one of the ships, again, thought they, I think it was by Spain, thought they saw some Japanese torpedo boats and shot at nothing again. And I, I think one of the things is, the, the conditions suck. I mean, it's not good at all. Yeah. But another thing that remember is that the Russian Navy, in contrast to the Japanese Navy or most of the professional navies of the world, like Britain, France, Germany, America, they didn't spend a lot of time at sea. Remember, they built their big fleets and kept them in port. And they yep. didn't spend time doing drills. They didn't spend time yeah. aiming how to fire their big guns. They <clears> just <throat> spent time on shore leave, basically. And so now this is the first experience that these sailors truly have of being at sea for a long time mm -hmm. and it doesn't work well so you wonder all right what if the british had to do this with their navy and they had the same constraints that the russians have they still would probably fare better because the britons are professional sailors i mean yeah. it's their career it's not just something they're conscripted into um and i think that made it even harder for Rolestvensky to to make this happen. Although he did. I mean, it was a logistical, it, it was a feat that he was able to get this, this Navy 18,000 miles 
as difficult as it was, he did do it, um, which is something to be, I don't know, if proud of or what, but I mean, you know, there's yeah. a, a lot of chances where they could have turned around. Can yeah, I just pause for a second too. and I'm, I'm having flashbacks of the movie 300 where, um, you know, the, the Spartans walk through the area and he says, Hey, what is your profession? Oh, I'm a potter. What's your profession? <laughs> oh, I'm a poet. Yeah. And then he yells back to his guys, what's your profession? Oh, and it's just, it, it, there's something different about doing that for a living as opposed to you know, a recreational soldier, I guess. Well, and that's a good point though, Cameron. Uh, I mean, as funny as that is, but that's, that was an old world type mentality where, oh, we're going to war, get the conscripts. And yeah, you had some professional soldiers and, and you know, the Romans did too, but even a lot of the Roman army was auxiliaries and conscripts. Um, and uh, although the Spartans obviously were the Greeks, but, um, but now in this new modern era, professional armies are starting to come into vogue. Uh, the Britons obviously have one, the Germans, at this time of the best land army in the world. France has a very large professional army. America's getting into that game though, not nearly as much as, as the European counterparts are. And so this idea of, all right, just get the farmers and we'll conscript them and we'll go to war now, that, that doesn't work anymore, which as we've seen play out throughout this war is the Japanese are professionals and the Russians aren't. Um, can't, and Eric, on the logistical side of things, after the Dogger Bank incident, but one of the things is Britain would not help the Russians. France helped them limitedly um, mm -hmm. to maintain their neutrality. But Germany did support their effort in this war. And the Germans were the ones that leased them the colliers, the, the coal ships, mm -hmm. to help them refuel while they're on sea. And I just want to get into that a little bit more. I don't know if you uh, researched that much. No, not not anything particular to them being German other than, you know, they had to arrange for these ships to come out and meet them at various points um, on this journey to refuel them, which is, again, that's kind of a, a wild thing. I'm not sure exactly when the ships convert over to diesel, um, but, you know, in terms of like the twenties or thirties, but just this idea of just hauling rock everywhere to yeah. burn on ships it's just kind of a wild thing you go from a navy that you just put your ship out to sea and just float around forever on the wind to now we have to find coal well and these are the first ships this is the first navies where they are 100 percent steam powered right they don't i mean a lot of in the 1870s to 1890s a lot of these battleships even though they had steam they still had sails yeah. to augment the steam this these are the first ones where it's steam or nothing and if you don't have coal you're dead in the water yep um yeah but so the germans did kaiser wilhelm supported nicholas's effort in the, this war and he leased 60 colliers coal ships to meet the russian fleet at various ports to help them recoal at sea um eventually you know, i guess so so i think you know why the germans helped the russians may have just been because the Germans aligning themselves opposite Britain in whatever they could, right? Because that's mm -hmm. the reason that the Germans were building their own fleet was just to match Britain's. Mm -hmm. um, so that might make a little bit more sense to say, well, we're going to support somebody other than Britain just to. Well, and it also uh, kept Russian naval interest and Russian military interests away from Germany. Yeah. So that they didn't, you know, if Nick is, if Tsar Nick's over busy in, Southeast Asia, he's not busy looking at Germany. You yeah. Know? Um, so there's a lot of reasons that the Germans could have helped them, but the Germans did, they, they did help them get there eventually. Oh, and so after the, sorry, the Dogger Bank incident, Captain Clado was one of the, the Russian officers. He was sent back home to St. Petersburg um, to testify on the Dogger Bank incident. But while he was there, he convinced the czar you know what we need? We need a third Pacific squadron. Let's make another fleet of older ships that Rohesvensky didn't want, and we'll send those to augment our fleet that's heading there right now. And those and will so go that, through the Suez Canal. Yeah. And so then 
Zara Nicholas tells Rose Fensky, hey, after he gets around the, the Cape of Good Hope, I think in Africa, and he's at Madagascar, and he's like, hey, we got a third squadron coming to wait to meet up with them. And Rose Fensky's like ticked off. He's like, I do not want to wait for these ships. We need to get there as soon as we can. Mm-hmm. But he eventually does. He has to wait for them. And so you have this third Pacific squadron that's meeting up with the second Pacific squadron. And then from there, they will head to now Vladivostok. And then from there, begin to, I guess, reassert themselves in, in the Sea of Japan and the Yellow Sea. Right, yeah. They're going to they're gonna need to get to Vladivostok there. They can resupply constantly. <clears throat> they can do these little sorties out to sea for a couple of days or weeks and just control the Sea of Japan and the Yellow Sea. Mm-hmm. And that's the plan, right? So yep. they're going to head north or head around Japan. Then they have to make a choice: do we do we take um, do we go through the Strait of Tsushima, straight through the Sea of Japan to Vladivostok, the shortest route, or do we go east of Japan and either go um, around Hokkaido or around uh, uh, Sakhalin, Sakhalin, Sakhalin Island? Yeah, Sakhalin Island, right? So those are the three options they have. <clears throat> and that's where, you know, the guessing game for the Japanese begins. How do we determine where to go meet this fleet we know is on its way? Uh, what, are the, what are the Russians most likely going to do? And as it turns out, because of the coal issue, the shortest route being through the Strait of Tsushima between Japan and Korea mm-hmm. is going to be what the Russians opt to do. I'm going to play armchair quarterback here, but... It seems crazy to me, and I'm looking at a map right now. It seems crazy that you think, oh, we're just going to sneak through this tight little area. I mean, in my mind, you've you've sailed this far. Why not go around Japan? Well, and you're going to run out of coal. That's basically it. Is that I think one of the things I read in, in, in my books was you know, a typical fueling of coal could get you about 2000 nautical miles. And some of those ships could not make it if they went the extra distance. Mm. And so they would have been stranded. So they had to take the shortest route to Vladivostok. But Karen, interestingly enough, you know, it, it looks so small and it is, it's a small pass. It's a straight, but the, the visible range of these ships is not as big as we think it is. And so you theoretically can run their patrols, go sneak through their patrols before they notice, and then they've got to try to catch up on you. And so it, it it's not like today where we have so many ways of seeing where everyone is via satellite radar and sonar yeah. and all this stuff. It's it's a lot more, I mean, they they have some primitive radio stuff, but it's still basically the human I mean, eye. They're, How they're far gonna... can the human eye see? They're yeah, gonna. The first thing they're gonna spot is they're gonna they're gonna spot smoke smoke from the from the smokestacks. That's where they're gonna spot first. They're gonna see a, a train of them, right? But even so, the Russians, even if the Japanese are waiting right there for them, which in some respects they are, they're prepared to come out to see to meet them. Um, the Russians have this idea in their head, regardless of what the last twelve months have shown them that they are the superior for, well, and not the numbers are what the numbers are. They are the superior force. They have the numbers, they have the bigger guns that they'll just go right through any Japanese blockade that's there and they'll get to Vladivostok because their, their objective is not necessarily to sneak through, but just to get to Vladivostok. And by everyone's estimation, including any observers, the Russians are going to, roll right over any Japanese fleet that tries to meet them. And that's yeah. the assumption that everyone makes, except for the Japanese. And, and dumb question, but they had to go all the way to Vladivostok to kind of restock, get ready <coughs> for the fight, because yeah. Port Arthur had already been taken yeah. at that so, point. They didn't have <coughs> access to the Port Arthur. Yeah, so they had to get to Vladivostok. They had to restock and refit. Again, on this trip except for when they thought they were being attacked by sneaky Japanese submarines and gunboats, which never happened on the trip until Tsushima, you know, um, 
they didn't fire. They didn't do any training drills. They didn't do anything that, you know, would have got them ready for war. And so the, the bullets they had were the bullets they had. And so they had to go and they, every spare inch of space was not used for, I mean, they had ammunition, but every spare inch of space was used for fuel, not for ammo. And so they had to get to Vladivostok so they could refit and then get back out there. Fair. But, um, yeah. And, and so another part of this though, is these weird delays. So Rojas Vensky and the second Pacific squadron didn't leave until October. And then he had to wait for the third Pacific squadron. Um, and they had to weather a hurricane. I think after they, uh, in Madagascar, so they had these delays. Port Arthur didn't fall until January 1st, 1905. And when it did, Togo was able to take his fleet back to Japan and refit, rearm, do repairs necessary to get the fleet back in fighting order. By the time the Russians arrived to Tsushima Strait, May 27th, Togo basically had just gotten his fleet back in fighting shape just a few weeks beforehand. So the point being is, had the second Pacific Squadron left a couple months earlier, the Japanese fleet wouldn't have been there to intercept them. Had they not had to wait for the third Pacific Squadron, the Japanese fleet wouldn't have been there to intercept them. All these things, again, these all these little mistakes added up against the Russians and the Japanese were there to take advantage of them. Because again, Japan only has the one fleet. They don't get, a, they don't get another shot if they lose yeah, that uh, fleet. Four battleships. Yeah. Yeah, because two of them sank. Yeah, they've already lost two. Uh, to Russia's, what, eight battleships, some of which are the newest. Yeah. And with much larger guns, eight to 12 inch guns, as opposed to six to nine inch guns, which yeah. means, you know, the ammunition coming out of them is heavier and more explosive. Um, so oh, go ahead. Yeah. And so I, I think kind of the, like Jake has said, these kind of moments where what if, the Russian fleet gets it earlier. Well, then they can run operations out of Vladivostok. They can run these small fleets, basically make force Japan to fight defensively because Japan in, in the moment right now can keep resupplying their, their troops that are away from Japan in Korea, in Manchuria. But if the, the Russians are there with their fleet, the Japanese fleet needs to be defensive so they can maintain that that logistical mm-hmm. operative line between Japan and the mainland. Once you put yeah. a Russian fleet there, it makes it so much more difficult and actually calls into question, do the Japanese then want to just end the war at that point? Yeah, Maybe they have to give up some it. things in order to bring their troops back. So, but that all depends on Russia getting their fleet to Vladivostok. And instead, while they're traveling at night because they're in a hurry, and they have to follow the rules of war, they can turn off all the lights on their ships, except hospital boats, hospital ships. Oh, sorry. You can't call them boats, Cameron. You know what the difference between a ship and a boat? Educate me. A ship has boats on it. Boom. Really? (laughs) That's, that's one definition I heard. I remember our former, uh, administrator our shared administrator he told me he and his grandfather were driving along the coast somewhere and he pointed out and said grandpa look at the boats and his grandpa had or maybe it was his dad right his dad had been in the navy he's like look at the boats he's like those are ships son like <laughs> you know okay those aren't just boats um but that's what i heard ships have boats on them i like that I, even if it's not real i like it it sounds it works. Real. easy to remember but yeah for whatever reason, the rules of war state, hospital ships can't turn out their lights at night. Yeah. See, dumb government regulation, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> well done. I, I, I still think it's, put that it's in there. hilarious that there's these rules of war that seem very arbitrary. And I, again, I don't but again, know if the interning but, rule still exists. But we do have, I mean, and these are all wars, right, that are 
brought upon by convention. Like after yeah. World War One, everyone got together like, OK, <clears throat> so what did we learn? <laughs> Mustard gas, bad. We're not going to do that anymore. So I, I, I get it. And everyone's like, to- uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. We don't have any. <laughs> we're good. <laughs> yeah, we're definitely putting that away. I now think we're doing remember, we're at our doorstep. Our missiles. And the, and, the, and the, you know, in the Revolutionary War, by necessity, the the, rev- the colonists had to get creative with the rules of war, you know, and yeah. it wasn't gentlemanly the way they fought the war. And, and so, I mean, these are all things that are all built over hundreds. So you guys go ahead and wear custom. red in the trees. Yeah. <laughs> We're just going to wear brown and green and stuff, but yeah. go ahead. We keep the red. Right. <laughs> so, anyway, moving on. So, so yeah, so, that's how the Japanese spot the Russian fleet coming into Tsushima Strait. And with that message, the Japanese do have wireless communication abilities. They're able to wirelessly convey the message to the fleet that's actually stationed in Masan, which is in Korea. So they can put out to sea to meet the Russian fleet. And so that was at 3.30 a.m. on May 27th Mm -hmm. is when the Russian fleet spotted. And the Russians have a firepower advantage. Their ships are bigger. And their their battleships are got much bigger guns, much um, larger displacement. And they have the same about the same but, number of guns between the two fleets, but the Russians but, are all bigger. Yeah, but there's but they're also slower. The Russian mm-hmm. ships, I think, can only go about twelve to fourteen knots max speed, and the Japanese ships, on the other hand, could go almost twenty knots, I believe. Yeah, the Russians are up to fourteen to eighteen but the Japanese okay. 17 to 20. So okay. they've got the speed advantage. They've got the, the, the Japanese still have, I think it's like 47 guns, but most of those are eight to nine inch. The Russians have 49 guns. Most of those are 10 to 12 inch. So it's the Russians have the firepower. The Japanese have the speed. Yeah. And so this is a big test. This is another philosophical debate on who, has the better tactics in this new modern war? Is it the biggest ships with the biggest guns or is it slightly smaller ships with slightly smaller guns, but they have a maneuverability and speed advantage that can Mm -hmm. help them out in this case. And this is, you know, I guess a conversation that can be had in in a lot of these modern wars. But in this case, the, the Japanese spot them at 3.30, they set out to sea. Togo, here is his plan, was to alternate daylight attacks with the battleships and cruisers and then night attacks with his destroyers and torpedo boats. And so during the daytime, his battleships and cruisers, his big guns just hammer, hammer, hammer the Russian fleet. And then at nighttime, the the destroyers and the torpedo boats just harass the Russian fleet until the next daybreak uh, and just continues to follow them all the way to Vladivostok. And it's funny. Oh, go ahead. He's planning this long, protracted, several days worth of battle. Mm-hmm. Right? He's like, we're we're gonna we're gonna fight with our big guns at day and at night. These little kidney punches while they can't see us, and we'll do that over several days. And with the assumption and wrote, that this is gonna last several days, right? And this is from Jukes, uh, who wrote the Russo-Japanese War. Um, He goes, so he says, here's Togo's plan. And he goes, Roland Svensky had done none of these things nor devised any tactical plan. Yeah. (laughs) So Roland Svensky's plan is get to Vladivostok as fast as we can. And and that's not a bad plan. I mean, we've (laughs) all taken that plan. I need to get to that place. I'm just going to go. I'll run a couple yellow lights. I'm just, (laughs) just going to go. But Togo's like, here's our opportunity to hit this fleet before they can actually make themselves more effective because sailors who've been at sea for eight months might not be in the best mood, might not really be interested in fighting, might Mm -hmm. want to get some shore leave. So for those of us that are um, more sports inclined than history inclined, I'm thinking, you know, Russia is like the, the Miami heat of the nineties, you know, walk the ball up the floor, slug it out. 80, 84 points wins you the game versus the the warriors lineups of death where draymond green is your six foot five center spread the ball shoot the three 
I think that's a good analogy. I do think there's a better sports analogy, and that would okay. be Muhammad Ali versus Joe Liston. Or Sonny Liston, Sonny Liston, sorry. Sonny Liston or George okay. Foreman. The float okay. like a butterfly sting like a bee. Okay. Muhammad Ali was not bigger than those guys. Right. But he was faster, and he knew how to weave, bob and weave, right? And and he knew how to rope a dope and all that stuff. And so his his ability to be better at fighting was a bigger advantage than George Foreman being a stronger puncher or Sonny Liston being a stronger puncher, you know? And I think that's where Japan had the advantage is they were just better. They just, they had more skill and Japan had spent the past year at war. Like the Japanese Navy spent the past year fighting the Russian Pacific yeah. fleet. Yeah, these you know, sailors they, had experience, call. whereas the Russians, mm -hmm. like you said, were not a professional Navy, but also they had not practiced or even had experience. How many of these sailors had been in naval combat before? Probably none of them. Well, not, all not. the Japanese have, right? Yeah. They've all been through it. Yeah, good call. Um, so anyway, the the those are the battle plans. So now it's morning. Togo crosses the T of the, tries to cross the T of the Russians so he can broadside them, but he wants his heaviest ships to be in the lead. When he turns the fleet, he exposed the Japanese fleet to the Russians who fired but weren't able to sink any ships. The J Japanese returned fire and sunk the Osilaba and set the Suvorov, which was one of those brand new battleships on fire. Eventually yeah, so the Suvorov sinks. Go ahead. Yeah, I just, you know, I'm, I'm kind of looking at these diagrams and <clears throat> having very little knowledge of naval warfare in general. A lot of this took me some time to digest it, right? So the Russians are coming this way and the Japanese are basically going at them. Yeah. When the Japanese realize where the, the Russians are, they turn and then they do a turn over here so they can get ahead of the, the Russians and they kind of follow ahead of them mm -hmm. and then they cross in front. And the plan there, Togo's plan was that crossing the T, right? So mm -hmm. all your ships get to fire their, their guns broadside and they're just gonna take aim at that, that lead Russian ship. Whoever's in the front, that's who we're firing at. And I guess to me, the advantage there is if you're a Russian ship and you're going forward and you have these ships going like in front of you, they're not to the side, your guns have to be firing like forward which means fewer of the Russian guns can actually get in position to fire at them. And yep. the Japanese mm -hmm. are moving pretty quick and they could just pound that first ship. Like you said, I think, uh, what was the the Russian? So the Suvorov, well, the Osilaba, yeah. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, that one sank. But the Suvorov, which is the flagship, that's where Rostvensky is, that one gets set on fire in that first volley, so to speak. Yeah. And he gets wounded. I don't know if he gets wounded then, but he does get wounded on the ship, um, on the Suvorov. And so pretty early on, your flagship is already struggling. It's not quite out of commission yet, but it's it's a struggle. Yeah, and the Japanese lose a battleship that just falls, the Asama falls out of line. It gets mm -hmm. hit and just kind of has to fall out of line. But I'm looking at some of these diagrams and the simplest one I found shows... The Japanese cross that T uh, just before three o'clock. Mm -hmm. Then they turn to cross it again, almost to where they have a, a U of their ships. So they're just hitting these Russian ships almost in a double layer. Mm -hmm. Then they go back around and cross that T a third time at around 4.15 p.m. Yeah. So they're just crossing this the Russian path over and over and over with the same strategy mm -hmm. of hit that lead ship. And then eventually they they turn so that they're going to run parallel with the Russian fleet after crossing the T three times. Yeah. Which, again, I don't know a ton about naval warfare, but it just seems like an interesting strategy. We're just going to hit that that front ship over and over and over. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And well, and, and it was an it was a I mean, I think it was a carryover from when sail ships were, you know, that was uh, ships of the line, right? They all get in a line. Yeah. And if you can cross a, a line's T, that minimizes their ability to, to hit you while you can broadside them. 
as right, you cross. Their guns and, don't turn yeah. and maneuver as well. And, and so it's kind of one of those old <laughs> tactics, but with a new, with new technology. But it was still an effective strategy, um, in the especially in the, in this war and in World War One. Less so in World War Two because fleets became a lot more dynamic by that point. But um, so the Suvorov sank. That was the set, that was the ship that Rostensky was on. He was transferred off the Suvorov and onto another ship. Rostensky and his wound it said he was several wounds, including a bone fragment in his brain yeah. from oh. that. Yeah, and he lived. <laughs> like, uh, I mean, <laughs> but uh, the the, the Imperator kind of walk off. No, no. I mean, he was transported. He wasn't walking, but. <laughs> <laughs> Imperator, oh, I knocked my mic off. I got so excited. All right. Imperator Alexander III and the Borodino, again, two more of those brand new warships were sank by 7.05 p.m. Uh, and then Togo sent his destroyers and torpedo boats to follow up with his plan to harass the fleet throughout the night. By the next morning, only two battleships, the Oral and the Nikolai I, were together, along with a cruiser and a couple of coastal defense ships. Uh, the Oral Nikolai surrendered that morning, and then the by then the battle was over. So, as you said, Eric, yeah, this is so something it, Togo had been planning for days of battle, and it ended yeah. in just over twenty four hours. Yeah, yeah, it was it was done by like yeah by midnight or so. Like by seven p.m., you know when I'm I'm looking at the one of these diagrams, the Suvorov got hit probably around four four o'clock or so maybe a little bit after and kind of fell out of line, got on fire. Um, the Alexander, the third, the Imperator Alexander, the third gets hit, falls out of line um, around six 30. And then the Borodino just blows up at seven Oh five. And in the meantime, Alexander, the third and Suvorov both sank roughly at 7 PM. So within about a 10 minute span of time, the Suvorov, Imperator Alexander III and Borodino, three new battleships of the line from First Division out of four battleships were gone. Brand new ships. Gone. Within a 10-minute span, those three sank. And that's... Now, it took them a while to sink. Like, from when right. they got hit. Like, they, they had sank, gotten but, hit earlier. Like, the, yeah. the Suvorov got hit much earlier. But within that time period those three ships all actually went under, you know, they had fallen out of line. They were spread out over several miles, uh, probably 20 kilometer, or, yeah, like 15 miles that they sank. Mm -hmm. And then by the time the next day came around um, and I've got, I got to find this, you know, what was it? Uh, the total number of Russian ships uh, is going to be, 39 ships that were part of this fleet, eight battleships, five of which sank. You know, we, we detailed the sinking of four of them, mm -hmm. but another one sinks as well. Four cruisers are sank, five destroyers, one repair ship, three transports. The Russians brought eight battleships, five sank, the other three got captured. Four cruisers got interned. Out of a total 39 ships, three made it to Vladivostok. Jeez. Yeah. Like, this is... No, I mean, we could... I One of my students, everyone always jokes with him. What'd you do with your 3-1 lead? He was a... He's a Warriors fan. Um, but it's that kind of you have a massive number of ships and probably the best sailing Navy at the moment that's out to sea in war and you lose 90% of it yeah. in 24 hours. And I think I remember reading, it was the most one-sided battle naval battle in modern history, except for, I, mean, I don't remember, you probably know better. Uh, there's another one in World War II, I believe. But it was that devastating. And if you pair that with the Battle of the Battle of Tsushima with the Battle of the Yellow Sea, Russia lost an entire Pacific fleet in two battles. Yeah. 
That's how devastating the Japanese Navy was in these battles. So, I mean, the casualties and losses, the Japanese lose a total of 117 sailors, 583 are injured. They lose three torpedo boats and a a total of 450 tons sunk compared to over 5,000 Russian sailors killed, 800 injured, 6,000 captured. Um, over 125,000 tons sunk. Yeah, this is yeah. this is not even I mean, to say it's one-sided, it's it's not it's a total victory. Okay, so and so let's I guess and, wrap and up the So battle. one other thing, one other thing I want to say is the Russian uh hit percentage was like 1.2% of their shots fired hit their mark compared with the Japanese who hit close to between three and 4%. But if the Japanese are firing more frequently, mm-hmm. they're, they're, you know, that 3% feels more like six or 7%. Right. Um, <clears throat> because they're smaller, they're going to be faster. And they're obviously hitting their targets in a way that's bringing them down very quickly. Mm-hmm. And and a lot of it's going to come down to the difference between the Russian military experience being you are conscripted. This is not um, something people want to do or be a part of. You're not trained well. You're not trained to take initiative. You're not prepared to handle this. But the Japanese is this professional military of theirs is their way out. It's their way to literacy, to three meals a day, to getting paid for doing good work. Um, to have an idea of something of loyalty. It's not, you know, what all the movies make it out to be, this pure loyalty to the emperor, but um, to be in the military is something honorable and they're going to treat it with the respect it deserves and actually carry out their duty. And that's going to appear in every battle that we've seen. Yeah, and I, I think we've talked about it a lot throughout the course of these four episodes, but, you know, that really... <clears throat> in one battle sums up what happened, right? You know, um, Japan was tra- treated their people better, uh, trained their people better, knew the scouting report, um, got a little bit lucky, executed better. So all of these things that they'd really been doing throughout the war all came to a head to say, yeah, this is clearly the class of this, uh, this war. And really kind of put a bow on it after all of this lead up the battle Tsushima put it to an end and and was all of the battles kind of combined in one to to top top it off yeah Yeah. Tsushima is like the uh like the dagger at the end of a basketball game right except it was like a 21 point dagger (laughs) hit that and yet the the opposite corner and just swoosh and they're like just give 15 points (laughs) <laughs> the Russians still didn't think they were done. Like they still wanted to roll after this. So this was in May. Okay. So for uh, one note is Rose Tvensky was transferred to a hospital and was actually cared by and visited by Togo. Uh, Admiral Togo met yes. with him while he was recuperating. And um, there's, and uh, there was a, in this, I don't know if it was a photo or an illustration, but in this illustration, there is a young lieutenant, lieutenant. Or sailor that's with, with Togo. And what's his name, Eric? Irosoko Yamamoto, who, who would lead the attack on Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor. Mm-hmm. So, and what's interesting about that is that during this battle, Iro- Yamamoto loses two fingers on his hand as an injury. And had he lost a third, he would have been unable to continue in service in the Navy. <laughs> because that was that was the rule in in the Japanese Navy is you can lose up to two fingers on your hand, but if you lose a third, you're, you you got to again another very odd rule right. for the military. Well, I think being having two working hands is kind of important in the military. So I I mispronounced it's Isoroku, not Irosoku. Okay. So so anyway, just another idiosyncrasy there is Yamamoto was there with Togo. Who, Togo was his mentor, like he based. A lot of what he did with Pearl Harbor and World War II on what Togo did here in this war. Um, anyway, yes, Cameron, you would think 
And Eric, this would be the dagger to the heart of the Russian war effort, but it's not. In fact, if anything, it just makes Nicholas want to fight harder. So yeah, in Nicholas March, who doesn't really want to run his empire. He just yeah. wants to fight. <laughs> yeah. But in March, uh, your favorite president, Teddy Roosevelt, had reached out to both sides and said, this is after Port Arthur Falls. This is before the Battle of Tsushima. He says, hey, I'm willing to negotiate peace terms with you guys. And the Russians said, nope, not going to do it. We don't want to have any part of that. We're going to send our fleet and we're going to take back everything that was taken from us. After the Battle of Tsushima, the Russians still don't want to quit. They, they, because they, even though they don't have a Pacific fleet presence, they still have hundreds of thousands of soldiers that are coming in from St. Petersburg via the Trans-Siberian Railway and are going to invade and retake the Laodong Peninsula and possibly the Korean Peninsula. That's the plan, at least. And so the rumor is, is that Teddy Roosevelt reaches out to Japan. He goes, if you guys want to win this war, you need to make a statement to get Russia to the table. And so Japan does. And that statement is on July 7th, they begin the invasion of Russian held Sakhalin Island, which is just north of the four Japanese islands, which Eric, you mentioned earlier in this episode. Right. So from seven, July 7 to 31, they invade and they complete their invasion on the 31st of July of Sakhalin Island. After this, because up until then, Russia hadn't actually lost any territory. Everything that they had lost wasn't technically, the, it was Manchuria. It was oh. of, like, they didn't actually own anything that they lost. They were just using it. And so, but Sakhalin Island was theirs. And so this was their territory that they were losing. So this is the actual first time in this war that they're fighting on not neutral territory. Um, and Japan needed this war to end because as we mentioned earlier, Japan is broke. Their economy is in a tatters right now. They can't afford this war to go on much longer. And so the invasion of Sakhalin is their gambit that this will bring the, the Russians to the peace table. Uh, Eric, I don't know if you had anything else about that that you want to go over before we get into the peace talks. No, I mean, it's that's an area that the Japanese and Russians have kind of competed over and had various claims to. There's another island, set of islands that's much smaller than Sakhalin that they still to this day have disputes over. Um, but no, I just kind of hoped Teddy would take the Rough Riders and join them but he didn't of course he didn't yeah um at this point so the russians finally agree to to peace talks with japan and those peace talks began on august 8th 1905 in portsmouth new hampshire and the russians appointed sergey vite to the peace of all negotiations. The places, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. I thought I know, that was can, so weird. How can you go to? How can you be angry in Portsmouth, New Hampshire? It's probably <laughs> lovely. I care. So that, here's some maple syrup. You'll yeah. feel better. So the Russians appoint Sergey Vit Vite, um, who is a holdover from was Nicholas's dad Alexander. Oh uh, yeah, I believe so. Yeah. So he's a holdover from Alexander. He was a a minister from from his father's time and who's very capable um, but he's cited as being vulgar cynical arrogant boastful and in present day terms totally lacking in charisma however he is very capable <laughs> and so his goal so he had like a 20 in intelligence and like a two in charisma as a, yeah. as a role-playing character Cameron, well, I, that's a funny. Dungeons and Dragons reference and you may not understand that and that's okay <laughs> about half our listeners will understand that half that's lofty maybe the rest of know. us I'll just I'll just keep coming with the sports analogies guys so yeah, he that's, he's like that's he why we make 99 in intelligence but his like wonderlick is off the charts there yeah, you his, go thank his, you uh, his charisma would be like a seven. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah, if it was a Madden um, thing. Anyways. 
It, there's a photo of him though with Roosevelt and the Japanese ambassador. He's a giant guy. Like he's towers over Teddy Roosevelt. So either Teddy Roosevelt is much smaller than I thought he was, or this guy is like six seven or six eight. He's a big dude. Uh, the Japanese mm-hmm. send um, Minister Komura to the delegation. And so Vite, his whole goal here is to flip the script on Japan. Remember at the beginning of the war, Japan was kind of darlings in the eyes of the European and American press. And so when they attacked the Russians by surprise, nobody really cared because the Japanese were, they were, everyone looked upon that favorably. So Vite's goal is to flip that script and to change the narrative in favor of the Russians. So, and he did. He was able to kind of woo the press and say, oh, well, these Japanese, they aren't like us sort of thing. And and they, you know, he made a show of going to church on Sunday and not doing negotiations on Sunday to make it seem like the Japanese weren't a good Christian nation and, and stuff like that. And by doing that, he was able to leverage the Russians position in these negotiations. And the Je- remember in Japan, one all the battles of importance, the Japanese won everything. But when it came to the actual negotiations on who got what, Japan was demanding an indemnity payment. So a big payment for the cost of the war, because that's what they needed. They also wanted their rights in Korea recognized, in Russian evacuation in Manchuria, fishing rights off the coastal waters, the cession of Dalny, Port Arthur, the South Manchurian Railway, Sakhalin Island and the secession of all captured and interred ships. So they wanted basically everything that they'd won in the war, they wanted the Russians to give up the rights to. And the Russians basically said, we will not pay you any indemnity and we will not give you Sakhalin Island. And if you don't agree with us, we will restart this war. So they were ready to, to continue this war if they didn't, if the Russians in a sense didn't get what they wanted. So the negotiated deal between the two sides was Japan gets Southern Sakhalin Island, they get Korea, Port Arthur, Dalny, Manchuria, and those fishing rights and mining rights. But Russia does not have to pay any indemnity and Russia gets to keep Northern Sakhalin Island. So the only thing, like I said, that Russia lost at the end of this war was half of Sakhalin Island. Now you can say they lost their port, Arthur, and, and those things, but th- that wasn't actually Russian land to piece. begin with. Yeah, so just access to exactly and kind of a, the sphere of influence. Exactly. So Vite was such a good negotiator that it, it wasn't a Russian win at the negotiation table, but it wasn't much of a loss either. He was he was able to prevent Japan from getting a massive payment which is what they really wanted because they said their economy was is on the edge right now. Um, but the conclusions of this, Eric and, and Cameron, of this negotiation, one, Russia no longer has a Pacific fleet presence. They, this ends any idea of Russian dominance of the Pacific Ocean. Well, they don't have a fleet. What's what I'm saying? But it, they, anywhere, like I, what ships well, they still do they the have fleet, left? They still have the fleet in the Black Sea, don't they? Yeah, the, yeah. I mean, okay. yes, they do. But they've lost like forty-five ships. Mm-hmm. I, that's just wild. Yeah, I mean it's unbelievable. But so they're 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 Southeast Asian colonial ideas ended abruptly after this war. So basically they were just, I guess we'll hold on to what we have, which is still the largest country in the world. But the idea of a warm weather port, the idea of exploiting you know, the, the South China Sea and, and the Manchurian land and Korea, that's all over. Conversely, Japan now becomes the preeminent power in the Pacific and East Asia. This sets them up to become a hegemon or a, a global power. Whereas before, you know, just 50 years ago in the 1860s, they were in danger of losing their sovereignty because they were so far behind. Now, 50 years later, less than 50 years, well, yeah, 50 years later, um, they are now a global power. They aren't as big as, you know, Germany, France, or England, but they're, 
They're definitely the strongest power in Southeast Asia. So I've got a question because what I'm what I've kind of read intimates it, but it doesn't go out and say it. Did Roosevelt have um, skin in the game? To it, was he leaning a little bit more toward? Um, I, I guess trying trying to take Japan's legs out from under them because I mean to win that decisively and yet to get so little in the treaty um, was, was the, were the chips stacked against Japan because of what, what Roosevelt was, was saying or doing or, or how he was behaving? Well, I, I would dis, I would disagree with that. Cause I think Roosevelt favored Japan. By all the reports I read, Roosevelt and Vite did not get along. They did not like each other at mm. all. And I think Roosevelt, like I said, Roosevelt was the one that told Japan, it's like, if you want Russia to come to the table, you need to do something, maybe invade Sakhalin Island. Like, so I think Roosevelt wanted Japan, if not to win, he wanted them to be in a favorable position. But they just didn't negotiate well, unfortunately. Hmm. Uh, Eric, before I get into the, what I want to get into at the end is, I guess, lessons from this war. Is there anything else you want to do on, on the conclusion or the peace talks? No, I, I, I think, you know, we can get into the effects. I think, the yeah, lessons. we can run right into that. Okay. So some of the lessons from this war, I mean, there's there's a lot to draw on, obviously, and we've discussed a lot of these to begin with. One of the mi- military lessons that I noticed. Um, well, uh, real quick, speaking of Japan's growth, by 1910, they had annexed Korea. They had acquired the German islands after World War I that were in the Pacific. They invaded Manchuria in 1931. They invaded Heartland, China in 1937. Invaded Mongolia, which was then held by Soviet Russia in 1939. And by 1941, they attacked French, British, and American holdings in Pacific. So. After this, they ramped up big time. Um, but some of the, the lessons that I noticed, you know, there, there's a lot of first, the first modern war, first entirely steam powered fleets, metal warships, radio, breech loading guns, you know, on land, the breech loading rifles, machine guns were in common use, mucked in largest battle at the time. First stage is a trench warfare that we kind of saw starting to take place in these larger land battles, which is all stuff that we've, kind of discussed already. But some of these lessons that the world, right, like you said, Eric and, and Cameron, we discussed, there's observers from all over the world watching this war play out. And they all took different lessons home that they could draw from. But I think a lot of the lessons they drew from were wrong. Because in a lot of these observers said, well, the reason Japan won is because they had this fighting spirit over the Russians. Like they had this like, almost like chivalric type ideal. And that's why they beat the Russians. It wasn't because they were just better at war, is that, but they had a, a fighting spirit, which is essentially an intangible. You can't, you know, <coughs> quantify that over one or another. Right. And that their patri- patriotic fervor won the battle. It was just, they were willing to charge and, and that's why they beat the Russians. It wasn't that they had training or tactics or better weapons or like logistics. It was that they just fought harder. And, and the reason that I, I bring that up is because that's the same mentality that gets used in the beginning of World War I, where just charge the line, boys, and you'll win. Hey, you're doing oh, it for Germany. For, you're doing yeah, it for you're France, it. for king and country. You know, just that right like yeah we're, we're you're doing this because you're german it's like well i was born in germany and you know the king of germany wants me to go to war and so since i was born here i speak the language i'm the one who's getting sent you know it's not that i'm screaming germany that's going to win the battle it's whether yeah. i execute my job well and and effectively overpower the enemy through tactics that, and trainings and technology yeah but that was right that was that old mentality and it's not you can't have patriotic fervor or fighting spirit, but fighting spirit isn't going to help you in front of a machine gun, right? Like, it's just, no, it's not. not. So, you know, what, what may have worked in, you know, in Sparta and in 300 is, you know, being able to be brave and charge the line and stuff like that. That works 
to an extent in hand-to-hand combat. It doesn't work when everybody's got a machine gun and you can stand 100 yards away from them and you don't have to get close to, to kill them. And But the, Europe didn't learn that lesson from this war, although they should have. They learned the wrong lesson because they attributed Japan's, vic- Japan's victory to their willingness to fight and their patriotism, not their tactics, logistics, or supplies or weapons. Mm-hmm. And I think we have the the benefit of context here too. You know, we can step back and look at it. What happened before? What was the lead up to the war? Um, as opposed to standing on a hill above the fray, looking at what's mm-hmm. being seen, you know, right in front of your eyes. So, um, yeah, it's it's interesting in history that whatever you're seeing, and and this is true in life too, is you know, you're never really as good as you think you are. And you're never really as bad as you think you are, because on a given day, there's so many different factors that are influencing the outcome of, of things. Yeah. And we have a tendency to oversimplify it. But like I said, we have, you know, here we are a hundred plus years later, um, sure. looking at the big picture as opposed to the small picture. Well, and, and one of the things that I, I think that's a great point. I mean, it's, it's easy for us to armchair quarterback, so to speak, because we have the benefit of 100 years of knowledge. But one of the things that I noticed is, and this is from the Jukes book, uh, Russo Japanese Wars, he was apparently left out of consideration where there was this idea that offense beats defense. Offense, you know, the reason Japan won is because they were always on the offensive. But they left out of considering, well, was the defense a good defense? Was it poorly conducted? the long time and enormous casualties that Nogi had suffered trying to take Port Arthur. They just kind of ignored that. Um, and also it, it, that ignores <clears throat> the fact that the Russians in those defensive positions, when they had those Hills didn't defend them, they gave up multiple times yeah. where they retreated because mm-hmm. they didn't know what yeah, else was happening rent. on the field of battle. And yeah. based on what they saw, it was the right move. But had they been able to communicate, they could have held those positions and actually held a good defensive position against a Japanese offense and inflicted more casualties and probably won a few major victories. Yeah. Uh, probably like Yalu River and outside um, uh, Nashan Hill, Nanshan Hill. Like those places, had they held the high ground rather than retreating, could have defeated the Japanese and held them. Mm -hmm. lack of communication led them to need to retreat. Another wrong lesson was, um, was that cavalry was now essentially useless. Horsed cavalry was now secondary at best, if, if not an afterthought in war. I mean, it didn't, it didn't have any effect on any battles. It didn't help Japanese or Russians destroy bridges or logistics or anything like that. But in World War I, every major player had a large horse cavalry that they brought to the war. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a fantastic scene if you've seen the movie War Horse. Um, and uh, the scene has Benedict Cumberbatch and Tom Hiddleston in it where they're riding their, they're the British cavalry and they, they're, they come upon very early in the war, this German camp and they, they charge the German camp on their horses and in the first minute of this battle, it's clear that the cavalry is going to dominate here. They're, they've got, you know, the high position on top of the horse. They've got their swords out. Um, the Germans are trying to shoot back with their rifles, but they're just getting mowed down by the horses until the Germans retreat to the forest where they have water-cooled machine guns set up and they just get on those, pull it back and start pulling the trigger and all of the the entire cavalry uh, troop is just wiped out, right? And so I, I show that scene to my students in this two minute scene, you see how early on cavalry is very effective and very quickly shifts to being not just ineffective, but obsolete by the technology. And if you follow the story of War Horse, you know, horses are still used throughout World War One to great, to great use, but not in cavalry. They're used to pull artillery and move equipment, right? So mm. it's just this great scene that illustrates perfectly cavalry is useless. 
just a wild oh. shift. And we knew that in 1904 and 1905, we saw it, but nobody realized it and applied yeah, it. Exactly. Yeah. And a couple wrong lessons that I, I noticed as well and that were pointed out was the Navy's ignored the lessons of how effective torpedoes and mines were in favor of bigger ships with bigger guns. I mean, the except for the Battle of Tsushima, none of the big ships were sunk in battle. They were all sunk by mines or they were sunk by torpedo boats. Like mm-hmm. the things that were most effective were not what was used in World War One or World War II until much later, until we realized that. And, and even World can, War II, one of the most effective ways we destroyed battleships was with airplanes, mm-hmm. with dropping bombs from well above, which again, turned made the battleship almost obsolete, obsolete at the end of World War II. <clears throat> so, and then um, last lesson that I noticed was Japan learned the wrong lesson uh, from attacking Port Arthur, assuming they could do the same in 1941. Uh, right. The, the the way that Japan played the war in, in the Russo-Japanese war is they knew that they were the underdog, but they figured if we can attack, seize the initiative and put the bigger guy on its back, they'll sue for peace because it's not worth fighting us, which worked against Russia. Yeah. But it didn't work, although the initial attack on Pearl Harbor was very successful it didn't work in the ensuing Pacific War with the United States and affiliated French and British forces. Right, and it's kind of odd because I, you know, if you if you just compare Pearl Harbor to Port Arthur, the lesson learned at Port Arthur is um, there were it was almost completely ineffective the attack on Port Arthur. Right, they they damaged a ship. And they kind of put Russia on its heels and surprised them. Pearl Harbor, they sunk several battleships, did a massive amount of damage, put our fleet like on its, not just its heels, almost on its knees. Both the United States and Russia were able to gear up and bring a lot to the fight after that. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess that that was kind of the wrong lesson. The Japanese learned that they could do that in the Russo-Japanese War. But World War II was three years longer than the Russo-Japanese War and allowed, you know, the lesson they didn't learn was you, you need to finish this quick. And they didn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. it's yeah. good call. All right, well, that's all I got. Is there anything else, any parting thoughts, Cameron or, or Eric? I know that the Korean War from 1950 to 53 is often called the Forgotten War in the United States, and it's not one that's talked about a great deal. Looking back on the Russo-Japanese War, I haven't really dived deep into a historical topic like this in a while. And um, this one seems very forgotten, not just the fact that it happened and had up until that point the largest battle in human history. Uh, fought on a peninsula that now I look at that peninsula. I even brought it up in class the other day. I had a map and I said, uh, you know, we're going to talk about the Japanese in World War II. And and I'm looking, I'm like, you know, the Japanese controlled this part of the world, Korea and this peninsula. And, you know, just after studying this, that that whole area ha- has new meaning to me because it's this very important piece that without what happened there, without this war happening and that those narrow passages of water and these across these rivers in Korea, um, a lot of the the geopolitical movements in that part of the world don't take shape in the way that they they will affect everything else during World War One and two. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm really surprised and kind of pleased to to learn quite a bit more. Uh, doing these four episodes. I agree. Cameron? Really fascinating. Um, Yeah, it's amazing how this just came full circle to me. Um, So much preparation and so much uh, um, 
you know, planning and, and logistics that Japan put into this um, with a little bit of luck, but but luck favors the the prepared, right? Luck mm-hmm. favors the um, you know the the hardest workers and uh, <coughs> just a, a cool thing. You know, th- there's so many themes in this that uh, I feel like really lend itself to life. Um, there's so many things that, you know, we drew a lot of comparisons to sports and, um, leadership and, and we talked about the classroom and and school. And I don't think those were stretches either. I think this, uh, war was very much a microcosm of life and, uh, really cool to, to do that. Cause that's how I learned best is I, I take what I know and I Mm -hmm. compare that to the new information and, um, for me, this has been a very valuable exercise to just say, yeah, you know, these, these principles that we know, the principles that, um, you know, we can observe here are very observable in other parts. So it's, it's just cool to have that confirmed to me. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with both of you guys. I think it, it was a joy to learn about this, some, this war in that it, it was something that I'd never known before and i'm really glad i was able to dig into it and And it's like it's so closely tied to american history too there's all these little connections that had i seen them previously man you know it would have enriched and now it does enrich kind of my understanding of american history and its role Mm -hmm. in this time period absolutely and like you said cameron like yeah we were we were analogy heavy but every one of them worked and i think that was really cool to see you know that that we could so effortlessly tie it to something else be it sports or teaching or whatever um so yeah it was it was fun it was a fun series um well then that's all i got guys i i I think we can wrap up this episode this series of dab out history russo japanese war part four and uh We'll see y'all next week. We're going to be starting a new series on what are we calling it? Is it Bad Men of God? Is is that still the working title? I think working so. Working title. I think working up with title. Else, maybe. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so uh, yeah, we're going to start that next Sunday, May uh, May eighth is when we'll finish film it. But um, you should guys should see that coming out next week. And and, uh, and what would be the best way for someone to know that something new is coming out? Like, like, comment, subscribe, and hit the no- notification bell. Ooh, he's got that down. Boom. He's got that down. Ding, ding. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess we'll see you all next week. Have a great week, guys. Yeah.